Um, I, I simply want, want to say thank you for having me here, but also I'm inspired by what I've seen here today. Um, I, must, I must tell you that in the short time bids have been uh, activated in Scotland, it's, it's, it's quite a remarkable what you've been able to accomplish. And I think it's also a testament to what I've seen in the three years with the International Downtown Association that shows the strength of this industry is sitting right here in, in this auditorium. And it's the sharing of best practices. And while, yes, there's a, a bit of competitiveness between uh, uh, neighboring communities and even neighboring bids, it still is the strength of, of a shared community of experts like yourselves who are going to grow the bid model and really um, continue to strengthen our urban centers here in Scotland and worldwide. So this is Warrington, Virginia. It's a Main Street, Virginia community where I currently live and not dissimilar than to many of the towns that, uh, that perhaps some of you uh, are operating in today. Small town America, county seat, more of a rural, rural community. And this is Detroit, Michigan. I grew up just outside of Detroit and had a very different experience as a child than I believe my children do and uh, certainly the life, life that we're trying to promote uh, throughout uh, North America. But wherever we are, I wanted to kind of bring us all together to recognize that, you know, bids in Scotland, SIDS in South Africa, town center management in North America, we've got uptown, midtown, and downtown. You know, it comes in a lot of different walks of life and, and terminologies. But essentially, it still is that diversity of, you know, how are we going to basically look at public-private partnerships? How are we going to leverage the partnerships that you've discussed here today between the local authorities and the private, uh, private property and business owners to really build community? And, and I'll tell you, one of the things I was impressed by was, on a couple of instances, the discussion about linkages to local schools and the programs that are being done to promote um, uh, business and job growth when the children are you know, not yet in university. But it's really the, the power of this private sector uh, investment in the private realm that has become so remarkable. Um, we've had public-private partnerships uh, in different areas for different amounts of time, maybe five to 10 years here in Scotland, in England, and uh, uh, much longer. The first BIA was formed in Toronto, in Canada, almost 50 years ago. So we've been working towards this. In North America, uh, predominantly U.S. and Canada, you know, we have approximately 2,000 to 2,500 district management organizations driving what I estimate through even our own members' annual budgets and levies of almost a billion dollar industry. So when we think about that, that's private sector investing large amounts of capital collectively into the public realm for the public good and the building of community. I think this is one of the things that, that I find most fascinating and, and see as an ongoing trend that you're all now a big part of, which is the changing role in civic governance. It is no longer just government that is supporting the work that we're doing and many more organizations and entities in each and every little town, village, and city center are playing a dynamic role in building their community. Two particular instances that catch my attention um, is uh, in Singapore, a national government which had been funding most of everything in the country came to the realization that it was an unsustainable model and looked to form the first private partner, uh, private public partnership with Singapore One, uh, Singapore River One. Also too, heard lately that even the country of China is re-examining the way they finance government and may even be considering property tax as a new financing mechanism. The ways in which we build community and the ways in which governments and private sector work together, I think will continue to change. So here it is, here's Detroit. Here's the Detroit actually my parents knew. I grew up hearing wonderful stories about going down on the boulevard, shopping at Hudson's, which was the major department store, meeting friends for lunch or going to the theater and taking the streetcar up and down Woodward Avenue. This was not the Detroit that I was familiar with. As you may know, throughout North America, we dismantled city centers. Uh, we abandoned many of them, Detroit being perhaps one of the, the critical worst cases in the Rust Belt. This is actually the demolition of that iconic Hudson's building, which was an, was an architectural uh, 
cornerstone for the city that stood derelict for almost 20 years because while we didn't want to get rid of it, we didn't know what to do with it because city centers through the 1970s, even through the 90s, were not a place where people wanted to be. These are neighborhoods that still exist today immediately surrounding the downtown portion of Detroit. It has literally been abandoned in many areas. It's a, it's a very large city that became, uh, in many ways, nothing. This being Times Square, many of us, show of hands, are familiar with Times Square, either in the media or perhaps have visited, maybe enjoyed a bit of the time there. In 1970s, it was the red light district. It was a crime-ridden neighborhood within New York City. And yet we all clearly know that it's transformed into something quite different today. The Times Square Alliance, another organization, a public-private partnership, was paramount to bringing Times Square around from the red light district to a successful retail and even entertainment uh, destination. It was approximately, oh, I'm gonna use that, uh, approximately 1996. So to give you that sense of what the evolution of is uh, in the revitalization, retail uh, rentals were still $200 a square foot, which was quite good and quite vibrant, even though it was a uh, neighborhood in transition. And in 2011, they're now commanding $2,000 a square foot for retail rentals. Certainly a success model. I like this image, and hopefully we can see it pretty well. It's an aerial, a nighttime aerial, actually early morning aerial, um, of Baltimore, Maryland. And what I find fascinating about this image is you can see where clearly the city center is, but you can also see the sprawling nature of development that's occurred in North American cities. Um, some, more some areas more dense in the outskirts than others. But I ask you to take a very careful look because this also shows me the future and what we see transpiring in these revitalized cities today. If you look in the lower half of this, um, excuse me, in the upper half of this image, you see headlights that are going into town, which we may understand to be kind of the traditional morning commute to the to workplace. But what you will also see is a steady stream of headlights to the, to the south of town where they're exiting. This is the trend that we are beginning to see. We are seeing the re-inhabitation of our city centers. And we are seeing as many people moving from the suburban areas commuting into the city for employment as we are seeing people who choose to live in the central city who are making that their dominant lifestyle and yet still are commuting out uh, for, for their employment. And much of this you'll see crosses demographic lines. Something that we've had to become much better at in North America as an industry is understanding how do we make that advocacy case? How do we elevate the conversation about public investment? And so uh, Joe Minicosi, one of our members uh, from Urban 3, has been doing a lot of work to say, let's actually start analyzing the impact of place as it, as it results in tax base. So on the far left, if we're looking at uh, residential tax base in the county, you know, maybe a dollar per square foot, or inside the city where it's a little more dense and perhaps attractive, $5.50 a square foot. But if we really start to look at how this evolves and how we look at Walmart, which are, is our, kind of our strip commercial, or into the mall and strip mall areas of commercial, we recognize that even that is not paying a dominant amount of tax base in six and nine dollars per square foot. It's when we get to the mixed use urban product, something that you find in all of your town centers, where you begin to look at two-story buildings uh, that are averaging $47 a square foot, three-story buildings even more, and we get into the mixed-use high-rises, six stories and above, and really start to generate that revenue that drives the entire community. We, Joe also took a look and says, well, is it the income tax? Is it the property tax? Is it the sales tax? Is there other aspects that help to fund these, these communities we are trying to build? And what you see across here is every state in the nation, and predominantly in red, it is property tax that is driving at least the U.S. economy, followed by the sales tax in, sales tax in a differing proportion. The individual states is not really the question at hand. It's understanding what is driving the strength of rebuilding a country whose infrastructure is aging. 
And if we even go beyond and start thinking about how we depict that story and how we emphasize the importance of that story. This is at Chapel Hill, North Carolina, looking at that same sort of data and recognizing that you do have your city centers, but also you can see, which is Chapel Hill to the far right. That is a pictograph, if you will, a GIS graphic image of the tax base that is driven by downtown Chapel Hill as a research center and a business community. Carborough, just immediately adjacent, where you now, now have another uh, densification of job nodes and employment and employment in residential and housing and really building uh, that edge city, if you will, also contributes at a higher, to a higher degree. And certainly when you get out into Hillsborough, it's that concentration that drives the financial capacity to rebuild the entire community. All of this sitting on top of uh, on top of the, the entire county. So when the question to the, the authorities and the government, and even as a business owner, when you look to locate, where is the tax base being generated, and how, do we, how does that affect the entire community? Throughout uh, Canada, a number of our members looked at what is the value of investing in Canadian downtowns? And while it may be difficult to, to read some of these, you know, Saskatoon, uh, Vancouver, London, and Edmonton, we're all looking at the fact that the land base of the downtown, that red portion in each of these maths, maps, the red portion is a very small amount of land, and yet it drives 10% in Saskatoon, Vancouver, 19%. In London, Ontario, 9% of the total tax revenue is all generated from 0.2% of the land mass in London. This is critical types of information that helped advocate that not only is the market demand uh, driving the revitalization of our downtowns, but it makes financial sense for, for, a, for a city, for a county, for a province uh, to really make that investment worthwhile. These are the sort of things uh, business improvement districts and other authorities are doing more of every day. So let's talk a little bit about bids. I think you've done, as I said, a remarkable job of coming up to speed and doing just about every, every aspect that you see on what we call Maslow's hierarchy of downtown management. And it's such that, yes, it often begins with, you know, maintenance, clean and safe. It's the core. It's what makes, you know, uh, our places enjoyable. And it's built off of festivals and events and marketing and, and beautification efforts. But very quickly, it immediately moves into business recruitment and retention strategies, pop-ups, things of that nature, and even getting into development projects. Many of the larger organizations are contributing to capital expenditures to help rebuild um, smaller infrastructures, make it more pedestrian friendly and accessible. And yet, at the very top, as it was already brought forward, was the idea of advocacy. This is, in fact, what bids do and what downtown management organizations do. And we can never forget that it does begin often with this clean and safe. As a couple of data points, if I think of uh, the city of Houston, the downtown core has 59% lower crime than the rest of the entire city. That makes for a much more attractive city center. And in Philadelphia, they've been able to have a 53% uh, index, uh, much lower than the rest of the city consistently over the last 10 years. This is all part of the foundation of the work you do day in and day out. We're all about creating vibrant communities, engaging the businesses, and really allowing them to be part of this city building or city revitalization, regeneration uh, industry that is moving forward. Things that we're realizing is the customer. We've talked about engaging the businesses, but the customer that we see is changing. And two, two major demographics that we think will have a huge impact moving forward is the millennial generation. You know, these are the, the, those who have entered the workforce recently, um, as well as women being a driver in both household income spend, but also in the use of urban place. So you can imagine having safety, accessibility, um, variety and choice is something that the new workforce who's highly technical, highly educated, highly entrepreneurial, and who collaborate together are choosing urban destinations to live and preferably to work because that's where their creativity can spawn new and increasing business. 
and women in the workforce in particular is growing uh, at, stat at astounding rates and is exceeding men in the workforce for the demographics moving forward. This is uh, future corporate CEOs, um, current CEOs, and leaders of our economy moving forward. Politi holding political offices, becoming architects, planners, helping to design our cities. This is a demographic that is going to continue to play an increasingly important role in decision making. And what of the next generation? I mean, it's going to be, think about the technology in the crib for this generation. We don't know yet exactly what's gonna shape uh, this, this uh, generation. The millennials, they lived through a global recession. They understand the interdependentness of all the countries around the globe. But for the Generation Z, it's a little bit of wait and see. But at least in the US, we know one thing, by 2040, there will not be a racial minority in the United States because of the diversity of this generation. This is who we are going to be building cities for. We are gonna be building cities that accommodate all walks of life, universal design, and a curb can often be a seat and a street a pallet when we begin to build community. So very quickly, maybe a couple of the trends that we've been talking about a little bit. Placemaking or tactical urbanism is something you may have heard of. Multimodal transportation certainly for North America is a priority. And regional cooperation, just a couple things I'll touch on. So tactical urbanism, you may have heard of it as lighter, faster, cheaper. The power of 10 speaks to having any destination neighborhood in your town. Are there 10 things to do at any one point in time uh, when you are there? Are you looking at seating and events and pop-up uh, experiences that make it more vibrant? Are you building off of your assets? So this, of course, is movie night, which many of you may be doing um, in your local square. But what's unique about this in Grand Rapids, Michigan, is they use their social media channels to allow the citizens and the users of their downtown to select the, show, the movies that were gonna be shown for that. Uh, for each month as it approaches. It's a very community-engaged process. When looking at what that next vacant building may become or may be renovated, is it the civic leaders who are deciding? Or as Candy Chang, an artist, began a movement of posting on the side of the building um, an opportunity for the community to say, I wish this street was, or I wish this building was a bakery, or I wish this boarded up building was a home. How can the community contribute to what they'd like to see moving forward? We heard about parking spots. You know, parklets are becoming increasingly uh, a new way of tactically grabbing more public space and making it uh, usable for the pedestrian rather than the automobile, where the restaurant owner invests in hardscaping the parking, uh, the parking space directly in front of their store. A far shift from where they were demanding more access for the automobile for their business success, now demanding greater access for the pedestrian and user. And here in New York City, a small example of road that was really gone to waste. And with a little paint uh, to designate the ground, ground plane in green, pop-up tents, some civic art experience. What used to be an abandoned intersection uh, is now an active space for the neighborhood to come together in the spirit of community. And there are untold additional examples of how we engage the creative artistic community to benefit uh, more of these uh, places where we can engage uh, cities and downtowns and our, and our town centers. Multimodal transportation. It really you know, is not just about the mode of transportation, be it bike or walk, bus rapid transit, but what role does the downtown organizations play in making people aware of those opportunities? Bike share has become a huge uh, opportunity throughout uh, North America, and also too, we're seeing a great deal of uh, shared economies, which, uh, I'll get to in one moment, but uh, you may recall, we used to use this slide years ago talking about uh, sprawl, you know, what is the road for all about? Is it for the car? And look how much space cars take up versus is it about the bus, a much smaller footprint within that public infrastructure? And is it possibly about bicycles, which is a very different uh, proposition? And it's simply to say, today it's about everything and finding that right mix and finding a way to uh, communicate to all the users of their options and how they will navigate the entire city. And we are seeing market disruption. 
Uber as an opportunity to privatize what used to be you know, the, the publicly managed authority around tax, taxis. You know, now public sector entrepreneurs are finding a way to deliver that service perhaps a little bit, a little bit more deliberately, um, a little bit more conveniently through technology. And I think we will see more and more of ways in which uh, market disruptions are gonna change the things that we need to be thinking about. Regional cooperation is another piece that I'd like to invite everyone to give greater thought to. And we heard a little bit about it from a tourism perspective, but as a recognition that while individual communities may be somewhat competitive with their neighboring communities, collectively, the, the daisy chain, if you will, of multiple downtowns that are all successful and all provide a different experience, collectively make the destination either a world-class employment and business center or a world-class tourist, tourism destination, and it's no longer just about the success of one city or one town center, but it's actually the, the range of communities within, uh, a, within an entire region that become successful. What was once a rail yard, an almost abandoned, busy commercial rail, rail yard just outside of Denver, took careful thought through the Lodo Historic District, which was its own individual business improvement district, to say, how do we create a transit center that serves the entire region? And over time, private sector, pr predominantly driving the renovation and the recreation of this, turned into the Denver Union Station, which is now a regional multimodal transit hub with heavy, heavy rail, light rail, bus rabbit transit, uh, bicycles, uh, just about every mode of transportation moves in and out of this entire area throughout the entire region, making it more competitive globally. We heard an example of Inverness and in the Tourism Improvement District. It uh, has started back in 1989 uh, in the California region. Um, this shown here at the bottom, the Napa Valley Wine Region. How can those businesses come together and think regionally rather than individually or just uh, one or two of the vineyards? In recent studies, we found that um, the, the Tourism Imp Improvement District uh, the primary reason for formation was insufficient existing funding, as we heard was also the case in Inverness. Fully 94% of those surveys indicated that TID's funds increased the destination's tourism promotion efforts, clearly a priority of Inverness. And 53 of those indicated that both domestic and international tourism promotion efforts increased during, since the district's formation. The small investment by all of the businesses into a larger entity to market and promote on their behalf and improve the area had ultimate benefits to them all. 97% of those surveyed indicated their destination became more competitive with the, with the TID funds. The same, I'm sure, is true for many of your bids. So I re return now to my hometown of Detroit. And what was once abandoned, I'm glad to say, is hopefully on recovery. Through the, through the private investment in public space here in Campus Marsh, what was once just simply a streetscape. They're even bringing in the beach for people to relax, in a motor city to sit down and gather in a new and different way, to come out of their buildings during lunch hour and enjoy public space like they had never done before. And yes, they're even considering putting the light rail back onto Woodward Avenue, the M1 corridor, which will be a vital connection between downtown, midtown, and the northern portion of the city, which I'm happy to say is actually has broken ground and will in fact become a reality. Detroit is one of those stories that people thought it was a war zone and it was abandoned, it was gone forever. And it's really through these public-private partnerships and the emphasis of good place management, having downtown Detroit partnership in place and driving that advocacy uh, message uh, consistently over time where we're now finding that there's opportunity again in the city of Detroit, just as I hope you're finding opportunity in all of your city centers and bids. Thank you very much.